is a very good morning. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's an honor to be in your first FedEx uh, conference. The topic that I'll be talking about today is about energy, more focusing on clean energy, um, especially on hydropower. I'll be also discussing a little bit on the challenges as well as an idea, a solution that we are working on and for you to also have some take back from that. So the International Energy Agency defines clean energy or renewable energy as an energy source that comes naturally. They can be replenished much faster than they are consumed. Of course, you have heard about solar energy, you have heard about the uh, energy that's from the ground, the geothermal energy, these are different forms of renewable energy. Uh, this uh, figure just uh, gives you a broad uh, overlook at how the energy uh, uh, evolution in our country in Asia. So it all started off in 1979 where we had our first uh, national uh, energy policy. But uh, truly the, the entrance of renewable energy or clean energy uh, came into perspective in uh, 2001 where the government actually introduced a five fuel policy. So, Today, uh, there was an uh, uh, authority which is called SEDA. Yeah? So this was set up in 2011 to promote uh, more use of renewable energy as well as to regulate them. Yeah? So what happens after the implementation of the uh, SEDA uh, to regulate this renewable energy? Uh, basically, ever since 2011, we started to pay more money. Uh, that actually happened. So, if you if you have uh, electricity bill in your house, you, you in 2011 you actually contribute about one percent of your bill to the renewable energy fund. So it is about a ringgit to every hundred ringgit. Today, uh, 2014, they actually revised this figure to 1.6 percent. That means you are paying about one one, one ringgit 60 cents for every hundred ringgit that you spend on your electricity. They build. But of course, as the renewable energy uh, sector grows, uh, we will expect uh, more contribution to the renewable energy because we need the money to purchase power from this renewable energy source. Uh, so eventually, we will be paying more electricity bills. So, what are the renewable energies that are available in Malaysia? So, these are a few of them. We have, of course, solar, biomass, biogas. Uh, mini hydro, which uh, will be the topic for me today. Uh, in total, uh, up to 2015, we are looking about a plant setup capacity of about 300 megawatts. Uh, how, how much is this? <coughs> this is about 1.6 percent of the entire uh, capacity of power plant that is set up in uh, Peninsula Malaysia, for, for that matter. So, one of the most cost-effective and the most sustainable renewable energy, for me, that would be hydropower. Uh, it's so unique that when we talk about mini hydro, these hydros are derived from a plant that is set up on a river, a flowing river. You put a small plant there, you run the energy using the source of water. But it is also applicable to large hydro schemes such as this. This is in Chandro Terra. The dam is owned by Kanaga National Berhad. This is fairly a large type of a power plant, hydroelectric power plant. But they too use renewable energy source, that is water. So here, in this figure, you can see the, the whole layout of all the major hydro plants that is set up in uh, Peninsula Malaysia, including Sabah and Sarawak. In Peninsula Malaysia, most of the hydro schemes are located in the northern part of the uh, country and also the central part of the country. This is because of the formation of our uh, city Wangsa region. So you have higher elevations there, so it's quite ideal to have large head reservoirs and, and uh, it is good for, for, for to set up uh, dams and plant at this type of location. So how much more potential do we have in terms of uh, putting up this form of renewable energy? In Peninsula Malaysia, now it is estimated about 
close to about 1,700 uh, or equal to about 2,000 megawatts that is available for us to put up uh, in the form of hydroelectric. How much is this? At the present rate, hydropower uh, in terms of fuel that is uh, running electricity in this country is close to about 10%. The other contribution, of course, we have coal, we have gas, we have oil. So these are the various other contributions. But hydroelectric really contributes about 10%. So the whole setup here is almost about 50% of those contributions. So there's much more things that we can be done to maximize the uh, potential of uh, renewable energy in our country. So here, one of the largest challenges that is being faced by hydroelectric plants is called sedimentation. Now, sedimentation is actually a natural process. If you have a clean, green environment with very forested land, when it rains, it falls to the ground, and some of these ground stays intact because of the vegetation that surrounds the ground. It's covered by good forest, good trees, so you don't get much of an erosion. But when this land gets disturbed, either for any purpose, such as logging, such as for development, if you look in KL, for instance, you can see construction sites popping up everywhere, and a lot of natural ground are actually disturbed, and this introduces sedimentation. When the rain comes, it actually starts to erode the sediment, and eventually, these sediments will end up in the streams and the river, uh, and also similarly to the reservoir. It's a very big growing concern in the world, especially with regards to hydropower. There's uh, really no exact single answer for this problem because they are struggling with so many uh, unknowns. But we are we are trying to engineer certain solutions to meet this problem. Now here you look, this is a, a very pristine river, a very clean, uh, a nice river. This is Kumai Kenye in uh, Kenye Lake. It contributes a certain portion of uh, discharge into the reservoir. Kenye Lake is the largest lake uh, in uh, Peninsular Malaysia uh, that's used for hydroelectric power. But what happens is when sedimentation comes to a certain point, rivers like this changes itself to this. Now, this sort of river normally, I mean, this sort of phenomenon normally occurs when you have a lot of bare ground waiting for the rain to hit it, erode it, and all the sediments flows with the water. So this type of river are quite bad, and they actually carry a very high concentration of sediment. This is another hydropower reservoir. This is located in Serra. Now, if you look at this, it changes itself into this, yeah? So here, you can see a good, clean reservoir has converted itself into a quite highly sedimented reservoir. So eventually, all these sediments takes up the whole reservoir capacity, and then you lose the storage that is needed to run hydropower. This is an example. This is in Ringlet. This is one of the most extreme case of reservoir sedimentation. The original capacity was roughly about 6.7 million. In 2015, we surveyed it and we found out that it only had about 40% of its capacity left. A lot of the capacity has been lost to sediments, roughly amounting to about 6.5 million meter cubes of sediment actually flowed into this reservoir since the 80s. How much does that really compare to? If you put that and build some international football fields, you can actually do 910 football fields. That's a lot. Probably we can host the World Cup then. Yeah, what are the causes of this uh, uh, problem? Like I said, there can be so many causes of it. Of course, some of them are uncontrolled agricultural practices, uncontrolled development in the hills. Yeah, so this contributes. So here you can see very steep cores, I mean very steep uh, grounds being excavated and, and uh, vegetations are grown on it, but when it rains, really all these uh, sediments flows down to the river. So there are so many solutions to this problem. Yeah? 
It starts off solution by, of course, the best solution would be to solve this problem at the upstream end of the catchment. That means doing something to control this deforestation and also the disturbance of the land. But that's pretty much difficult to do because people want to generate revenue, people want to grow, the country wants to develop. So, so this is a practical solution at the top. But at the other end, you also have a solution such as work uh, that involves dredging, uh, excavation. Uh, between 2005 and 2007, Sanaga National Brahad actually spent close to about 150 million ringgit just to clear off a certain volume of sediment from the reservoir. Now, what actually occurred was, two years we actually spent about 150 million, the next two years it actually filled up. So in that case, you can't be spending so much of money and the problem is still persisting. You needed a radical approach. So we came up with this idea of having a sediment bypass tunnel. So this idea is still being researched. Yeah. Of course, this type of structure has been implemented in various other countries, such as in Japan. I was in Switzerland a month ago. They also have this structure there. So virtually how this structure works is that you have this kind of uh, component of the structure. You have the intake, you have the tunnel, you have the outlet, as well as you have the controls of the gate, which allows you to do certain regulations of flow. The reason of having such a structure is that normally a higher concentration of sediment occurs during large flood events. So if you allow these large flood events to pass through the stream and into your reservoir, your reservoir basically gets loaded up very fast. So the only way to do is a stop operation at the time of a flood, close all the gates and open up the sediment bypass. Virtually it bypass the system and it flows downstream. So a lot of the incoming sediment does not get deposited in the reservoir. By that way, you can actually prolong your life of the reservoir then without the bypass tunnel. Yeah, so the terminology is almost the same as having a heart problem. Yeah, you do, you, you, you actually go on medication if you have a heart problem, then you put a stand. Of course, the one step before doing a full heart transplant would be to do a bypass because it's so blocked that you really can't, there's no way to go about it, so you need to do a bypass. So this is the name of the tunnel. At the moment, this type of structure, they are, they are not there in Malaysia. Yeah, we have the smart tunnel for flood, but this is the first one of its kind for sediment. Yeah. So the benefit, like I said, a lot of the sediments can be diverted out from the reservoir. You can conserve your storage for power generation, clean power generation. You can also control the flood, yeah? So downstream, sometimes certain dams, we have people living downstream, so you need to also protect these people. So this kind of structures will definitely help. And of course, you can always prevent loss of life. This, this type of incidents have happened, people really lose their life eh, for these uh, cases. So in conclusion, hydropower is a very important form of energy yeah, in Malaysia. So it should be maximized in order for us to have really good uh, relationship with the environment in terms of energy generation. Bypass tunnel provides a very sustainable solution in terms of sediment management. So this we are working on very closely in order to get this uh, structure built. And hopefully we will have the first one to get better results for those reservoirs we are having problems. Now what can you do in this regard? As a, as a consumer, what can you do? Now, apart from having renewable energy, which is the cliche now, yeah, everybody wants to have a lot of renewable energy, solar power, you know, all those kind of things. But really, it, all, it actually contributes down to your consumption. The consumption, the need for a power plant is based on the consumption of the population. So if you really can control your habits, the way that you use electricity, that will actually reduce the need for putting up new plants to actually meet the those demands. So what I'm trying to say is stop doing a lot of internet, you know, stop doing a lot of iPad, you know, games and 24 hours in front of the TV. Go outdoor, play games, do farming. Yeah, do farming. Take a shower, 
do a farming. Yeah? Now, the reason is because if you spend, let's say, four hours doing farming, virtually you're not using electricity. You're virtually using your own energy to do some work. So in that way, you're actually saving the Mother Earth as well as you are contributing uh, to a less uh, polluted uh, environment. Yeah? So a good friend of mine told me once, he said, Jensen, I'm having a problem. My electricity bill is sitting up to 500, 600 ringgit a month. How can I make it go down? So I gave him another example. This is my house, back in my hometown in Pera. Yeah, It looks like a shed, but it's a house. Yeah, I've been living there since birth. My parents are still there. The total electricity bill actually comes about 50 to 60 ringgit. Yeah, but if you do that in KL, I'm sure you're not going to hit 50 or 60 ringgit. But it's still in Malaysia. Yeah, but of course, we do a lot of own farming. We have a lot of trees surrounding our house. So all these are actually very important in order to conserve the environment. So with that, thank you very much.